Oh, and we're, we're just so excited tonight to um, have as our speaker, Wynne Brown, who uh, has recently published a wonderful book on the life of Sarah Plummer Lemon. Um, the title of the program is Following the Footsteps of a Forgotten Botanist. Um, and it's going to be a visual journey through the life and work of Sarah Plummer Lemon. This program is, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but it's a visual journey <laughs> through the life and work of Sarah Plummer Lemon, for whom our beloved Mount Lemon is named. Wynn Brown is the author of The Forgotten Botanist, Sarah Plummer Lemon's Life of Science and Art. So here's an opportunity that not everyone will get to get behind the scenes and experience photographs, artwork, and other details not included in this wonderful book. Some of the artwork was too damaged to be reproduced for the book, and we'll learn the nuts and bolts of the preservation process for some of these pieces, and also about some of the plants that are named for Sarah. Wynne will also read a short selection from the book and share with us details of her research journey. And so our presenter tonight, um, Wynne Brown, is a freelance writer, editor, and graphic designer based here in Tucson. And she is the author of several books, including this wonderful new one, The Forgotten Botanist. It was published last November by University of Nebraska Press, and it has already won the 1920, I'm sorry, <laughs> the 2022 Spur Award for Best Western Biography, and was also a 2022 Southwest Books of the Year top pick. In addition, Wynne spent the last three months as writer in residence at the Pima County Public Library, and we were talking about that uh, before the program and some of the details of that experience. Um, and then finally, I do want to say that in the chat, there is a list of places that you can get the book if you'd like to buy a copy, um, and also including mostly books, which didn't get into that list. So Without further ado, I'm anxious to turn this program over to Wynne and hear everything she wants to tell us about the forgotten botanist. Thank you, Wynne. Thank you, Susie. Let me see um, if I can share my screen here. Um, let me get rid of this. Oh, there she is. Looks perfect. Okay, great. There's a, for some reason, let's see. I'm seeing the Zoom window on top, but maybe you all aren't. Okay. Um, and let me minimize you all. All right. Okay. I think I um, I think that I think it's working. Hooray! <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Susie. That's a lovely introduction. And you know, I remember the last time that I spoke to this group, and I'm astounded that how long ago it was. It was October 11th, 2018. Um, I mean, talk about the before times. We were at, we were all at the Ward Six office, and oh my, what a lot has happened since since then. Certainly in the world, but also with the Sarah Lemon project. Let's see, why does that not? Work? There we go. Um, so as Susie said, I'm a, a freelance writer, editor, and graphic designer. Basically, I think of myself as a three-legged stool. Um, and the screen shows just a few of the books and other projects that I've worked on either as a writer, editor, illustrator, designer, project manager, or some combination of all of those. And, but not surprisingly, of all of those projects, the one that I'm the proudest of is, is this one. Um, as Susie said, it was released last November, which is really exciting because uh, as many of you know, I worked on it for seven years. My background is kind of like Sarah's in that I'm a mix of journalism, biology, and scientific illustration. But, you know, really what I think of myself primarily as is a storyteller. 
to me, stories are the connective tissue that can attach us to our land, to our forebears, even to our entire culture, whether that be local or global. You can see more about the tools that I use to tell those stories at my website, and not surprisingly, that's winbrown.com. If you click the research tab on that website, it'll take you to the project newsletter, which is the best way to get updates on book related events. And thank you, many of you are already on this newsletter list, and I really appreciate that. Um, as you know, each one has snippets about Sarah. It's free. Um, it gives dates of when I'm going to be doing public events. Um, and I'm pretty good about only sending it out if I really have something to announce because I don't want to just flood everybody's inboxes. I'm also happy to say that it won a national newsletter award last year from the National Federation of Press Women. Um, if anybody wants to be on the newsletter list who isn't, if you just email me at win at winbrown.com, I'll go ahead and add you. And I don't ask for money either, unlike all the emails that we get this, this time of year. So this evening, what we'll do is uh, first I'll give you a brief overview of the project itself, the story behind Sarah's story. Then I'll zip through a bare bones quick timeline of Sarah's very packed, very productive life. And after that, we'll look more carefully at some of the plants that she collected and the paintings that she made from them. Most of those paintings were done in the Chiricahuas and the Huachucas. And for this group, I need to say, I am not a botanist, so do let me know afterwards if I've committed any botanical bloopers. Then to wrap up, you'll see why it is, I think, that Sarah is a significant hidden figure of science and what's next for her work. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So when I first started all this, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, about 15 years ago, I first learned that Arizona's Mount Lemmon is named for a woman botanist of the 1800s who climbed it on her honeymoon in her 40s. That was pretty intriguing. Later, I read that the University of California and Jepson Herbaria archives in Berkeley had six linear feet of material on the lemons. My first thought was, Somebody should do a book. Well, now I know that there lie monsters among those words. So talk about a gift to historians. Sarah was very close to her family. She wrote every week, wrote home every week, mostly to her father and to her younger sister, Maddie, or Martha Plummer. I made three trips to Berkeley archives and I photographed what turned out to be 1,200 pages of Sarah's handwritten letters. I then moved them to my hard drive and I read them all, which was sometimes kind of challenging. Sarah was a frugal type and to save paper, she often wrote across her own handwriting. So she'd write on one side of the paper, turn it over, write on the back side. Paper was thin, sometimes it would bleed through. She'd turn it back again, turn it sideways and then write across sideways. And that was something that was quite common at the time called cross writing. This slide gets us a little deeper into the Plummer family history. You already know about Sarah's sister, Maddie, who married a man named Everett. Well, Maddie had a daughter, Sarah's niece, and confusingly, her daughter was also named Maddie. Maddie Jr. had a son, Harold St. John, who would be Sarah's grand nephew. Harold grew up to be a noted botanist in Hawaii. And he had two, in fact, the, at the University of Hawaii, the Plant Sciences Building is named for him. Uh, Harold had two boxes of Sarah's paintings and they were stored at his house in the basement. When he died, his granddaughter, Amy St. John, donated those two boxes to the archives at Berkeley. And here they are. Tragically, these two boxes hold all that's been found so far of Sarah's artwork. They're all watercolors, they're all on paper. And because of both their age and because of Hawaii's humidity, they are much too fragile to ever exhibit or even handle as you'll see in a little bit. We'll get back to that. So I knew that I wanted to do a book about this. And as many of you know, these days you can publish a book independently or you can go the traditional publishing route. I'm a huge fan of independent publishing. In fact, helping authors tell their stories and publish their books independently is part of how I make my living. But in this case, I really felt that a traditional press was the best strategy for this particular book. 
because it's nonfiction, I first wrote a book proposal. And sometimes the book proposal is almost as much work as the manuscript. My proposal is 100 pages. Over the next two years, I submitted it to 24 different agents, commercial publishers, and academic presses. And that's the stage that I was at when we all last met in October 2018. A year later, in October 2019, I signed a contract with the University of Nebraska Press, and they've been absolutely wonderful to work with. And I'm especially pleased that the book is what they call a bison book, because that's their trade imprint for general interest readers. So then the next process, part of the process was writing the actual book. And as you can see, I have excellent office help. One year later, late on a Friday night, last October, 2021, UPS knocked on the door and made a delivery, a whole box of real honest to gosh, actual books. And I, it's, and I think it's a really beautiful book. I'm very happy with all the decisions that they made. I'm also really pleased to tell you that as of last week, the University of Nebraska Press has totally sold out of the first printing of the book in six months. Okay, that's enough about the bookmaking process. Let's move on to the story of Sarah Allen Plummer Lemon, for whom Arizona's own Mount Lemon is named. She was born in New Gloucester, Maine on September 3rd, 1836. So her biography was published the year she would have turned 185. As you know now, she was the middle child of five. You already know about her younger sister, Maddie. And she also had two older brothers and a younger one. Now, uh, here's a picture of Maddie some years later and father, Micah Jaw Sawyer Plummer. Interestingly, in those 1,200 pages of letters, there's only one directly from Sarah to her mother, who was Betsy Haskell Plummer. I know that Betsy had some significant health problems. Um, who knows why those letters haven't survived? It could just be that Maddie was the keeper of correspondence and Sarah's mother was not. At the age of 20, Sarah left home to attend the Ladies Collegiate Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts, where she earned a certificate in teaching calisthenics. And that's what we now know as gym class. That's actually pretty ironic because Sarah's health had always been fragile. She was constantly coming down with colds and bronchitis. In 1861, she moved to Brooklyn, New York, and she graduated from the Greenleaf Female Institute with honors doubly certified in chemistry and physics. Then the following year, she was accepted to an institution called the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. This was a really interesting institution established by Peter Cooper and who made it clear that it was open to both genders, all races, any age. All he wanted was people who were interested in learning. Sarah loved it. She studied chemistry and physics at night, and then she supported herself by teaching gym or calisthenics and also art during the day because she had always been artistic. She loved her life in New York City. She was constantly busy teaching, soaking up the intellectual and artistic opportunities. And in a really, what I think is a pretty interesting bit of foreshadowing, she also made time to volunteer at New York's Bellevue Hospital as a nurse for wounded Civil War soldiers. This may well be where she first crossed paths with Clara Barton. And of course, Clara Barton would go on to establish the American Red Cross. Again, I think it's just very ironic that Sarah would work in a hospital given her own fragile health, because again, she was still having terrible respiratory problems and then in 1863, she nearly died of measles that she'd caught most likely at the hospital. In 1870, she almost died again, this time it was pneumonia, and she realized that her whole life really depended on escaping the bitter Northeastern winters. So she made a huge decision. She decided to move all the way across the country, all by herself to California, where she didn't know a single soul. This was not an easy jaunt. The railroad had been established, but it was not a reliable and it certainly wasn't a way that a woman traveling, a lady traveling alone should do. So instead she went the long way around by steamship. She eventually disembarked in San Francisco. She stayed there for a month. She liked it, 
but she realized that her lungs were still not up to the Bay Area's cold and damp. So she headed south to Santa Barbara. When she got there in 1870, the population was 2,970. It's Dave and I went there and are following the footsteps of Sarah and it's a whole lot different right now. Santa Barbara was lovely, the climate idyllic, especially the winters compared to Manhattan, but she found that the intellectual stimulation was a far cry from New York City. And this is when she wrote to Maddie, it is like death to me to be idle. And worse yet, there was no library. So she rounded up donations and hundreds of books and she established Santa Barbara's first library. And here's a picture of some of the boxes. It looks like early Amazon delivery. She got donations from people all over the country, but especially New York and California. As she recovered her health, she took long walks along the beach and in the hills above Santa Barbara. She was, she had always been insatiably curious. And so she ended up teaching herself botany by using her artistic ability. This earliest surviving painting is most likely a flowering fruit tree, maybe probably an apple. Those brown spots on the, on the artwork are called foxing. Possibly it's fungus damage from the humidity or another possibility is it can be tiny pieces of rust from the metal fragments that in the, when the paper was manufactured. Sarah still missed the stimulation of New York City, so she also set up a lecture series, and that may be what brought this man to Santa Barbara. John Gill Lemon, who usually went by J.G. Lemon, was born in Michigan in 1832, so he was four years older than Sarah. He became a teacher and then the county superintendent of schools. And he'd started attending classes at the University of Michigan, but then the Civil War began and he enlisted in the Union Army in June 1862. He was in 32 battles in between working as an army nurse, and then he was captured in August of 1864. In this slide, the picture on the left is J.G. Lemon, the one on the right is not. When J.G. was captured, he was first sent to the Florence Stockade in South Carolina and then the infamous Andersonville prison in Georgia. The picture on the right is typical of what the few survivors of Andersonville looked like when they emerged, if they did. J.G. was released in 1865 at the end of the war and he wrote later, that after, quote, a year of liberal diet, unquote, his weight had increased to 90 pounds. And this was a man who, who was about six feet tall. With his mother's help, and she's quite the story herself, he moved to Northern California to convalesce at his brother's home in Sierra Valley. JG had always been interested in botany and plants. And so he started learning the Western plants that were he found in his, in his brother's yard. The ones he didn't know, he sent to Harvard University because that's where Dr. Asa Gray was, the preeminent American botanist. And I call this my bounty of mostly bearded botanist slide, um, except that Edward Green didn't get the, the memo apparently. This, as you all know, I, you know, I think of this as a planetary system with all of these botanists orbiting around Asa Gray because this was a time of really frenetic botanic activity in the 1870s. All of these men were in frequent communication with one another. And Sarah, by now, had educated herself to become a knowledgeable amateur botanist. And both she and JG corresponded with all of these men. And later on, they often socialized with John Muir and Charles Parry. In 1876, JG showed up in Santa Barbara, most likely at a lecture at Sarah's library two years after this picture was taken. He's, he's not exactly a slouch in the whiskers department either. Like Sarah, he too had terrible, terrible health issues, but his were because of his POW experiences. The two of them started botanizing together in the hills above Santa Barbara. JG became smitten with Sarah to the point where he asked Asa Gray to name this particular plant for her. And this is Plummer's Baccarus, uh, and it's still named that. 
A year later, he worked up the courage to propose to Sarah and she turned him down. She said she loved him deeply, but she felt they were both too sick too often to marry. They remained affectionate pen pals for the next several years. Then Sarah got sick yet again, this time really, really sick with spinal meningitis. This was in 1880. She nearly died yet again. And apparently that changed her mind because they were married on Thanksgiving day, 1880. Or as Sarah described it to Maddie, they quote, plunged into the matrimonial vortex. She was 44 and he was 48. She relocated from Santa Barbara to Oakland and moved in with JG and his mother, which, which apparently worked out fine. Everybody got along. The two of them resolved at Sarah's suggestion that as JG wrote later, quote, instead of idling our time in useless saunterings and listening to silly gossip, unquote, they would delay their honeymoon until the growing season. And at that point, they would, quote, make a grand botanical raid into Arizona and try to touch the heart of Santa Catalina. And you can see in this letter, she refers to Lamonia, which was Sarah's pet name for JG. And as we talked about a little bit before the session started, he referred to her as a mobilis. And that's the species name of the tree that first enticed him to studying botany. But it also means lovable in Latin, which I think is very sweet. So in April 1881, they arrived in Tucson by train and set up camp in the foothills north of Fort Lowell. And at the time, Fort Lowell really was a fort. They then spent two weeks struggling to get to the top of the range from the south side and failed. And I'm now going to read for a passage from the book. The couple deliberately planned their trip for spring, one of southern Arizona's two prime times for botany the second being late summer when the monsoon storms reawaken the parched desert. Sarah's artist eye, accustomed to coastal New England and California, was astonished. Green-trunked Palo Verde trees showered the ground with golden blossoms. Bright yellow brittle bush still flowered in the shade. The long witch's arms of the Ocotillo stretched toward the sky with scarlet fingertips and barrel cactuses were studded with brilliant orange blooms. Even the wildlife was bizarre. Gambles quail chittered, their ridiculous top knots bobbling as their call of cuidado, cuidado, warned thumb-sized youngsters of Cooper's hawks swooping through on a speedy and often lethal ambush. One long-tailed bird didn't fly, but ran past their camp campsite and a large pink and black beaded lizard lumbered along the wash, its shiny leathery tongue licking up unwary ants. Otter yet, the serpents wore rattles and they were not afraid to shake them in warning. Creeks lined with green carpets of sedges and punctuated with hop bushes still trickled clear with snowmelt, and the descending trill of an occasional canyon wren reverberated off canyon walls. At night, Coyote choruses woke the lemons, alerting them to the scuttle of skunks in search of any escaped food scraps among the dry leaf litter. The magnificent yet improbably comical sentinel saguaros, home to Gila woodpeckers and gilded flickers, towered over it all. Day after day, Sarah and JG scrambled up and down steep cliffs and ravines among plants that seemed determined to draw blood. Opuncha spines, cat claw thorns, yucca spears, agave bayonets. They dodged the bundles of prickly fallen teddy bear choya, while always keeping a watchful eye out for the rumored Apaches. They each lugged water, a little food, plant presses for flowers and leaves, and wads of damp rags to wrap and preserve any prized and fragile ferns they might find. At first, it was all such a contrast to the cool fogs of the Bay Area that Sarah paused frequently to inhale the essence of the desert, to savor the sun's heat penetrating that olive green broadcloth she wore, and to allow her eyes to stretch over the vast expanse. Each evening, the sun sank behind the jagged Tucson Mountains. To the southwest, hunkered Baba Kivri Peak. The Santa Ritas underlined the southern horizon, 
and dawn broke behind the Rincons. Farther east were the Whetstone Mountains and Tombstone, where the shootout at the OK Corral would occur a few months later. But spring is short in the desert. As the days wore on, daytime temperatures rose until the heat was torrid. The closest spring, three quarters of a mile away, shrank to a dribble so small, the honeymoon couple had to squeeze their rubber drinking cups into crevices to get any water at all. They found a tiny cave halfway up the mountain and made numerous trips to ferry all the gear so they'd be closer to the top, their ultimate destination. The days grew even hotter, the terrain more rugged. And yet, both of them were deeply happy, exclaiming joyously to each other as they found new glories, an unknown agave here, a mystery mallow there, and busily spent every evening pressing, packing, and labeling the day's finds. They gathered seeds of one attractive bush with deeply dissected and particularly pungent leaves to plant back at their Oakland herbarium. Later, Asa Gray named it to Getty's Lemon Eye, or Lemon's Marigold. Eventually, it would become the stock that still supplies nurseries nationwide. Each day, they covered a different route, thinking this one would wind its way to the top of the mountain. Each day, they'd end up peering down a 500-foot deep ravine or hopelessly up at an unclimbable cliff. Three times, they set out on paths that surely aimed for the summit, and each one dwindled into yet another dead end in terrain much too rugged to cross. Finally, one afternoon, they reached a point high enough they could see another ridge topped by the true upper peaks invisible from the desert below. Between them and the peaks was, quote, an abyss 2,000 feet deep and twice as far across that everywhere separated us from the main mountain. There was no help for it. We must return, baffled, J.G. wrote. Beneath us yawned the chasm. Beyond and far above stood the guardian pinnacle, between which lay the narrow saddle through which we could not pass, unquote. After two weeks of rugged field work and three blisteringly hot attempts to reach the top, both Sarah and JG were exhausted and they were nearing the end of their supplies. Yet they still were not completely defeated. They lugged their equipment back down the hot rocky slopes and returned to town to rest. They talked to locals who suggested the other side of the range should be more accessible. So within a couple of weeks, they then got in touch with Emerson Oliver Stratton. You saw his picture in the previous slide. He owned the Pandora Ranch on the north side of the Catalinas. Stratton knew a route to the top, even though he had never actually been there, and he had pack animals to the 9,157 foot peak. Much later, he wrote, we went to the highest peak of the Santa Catalinas and christened it Mount Lemon in honor of Mrs. Lemon, who was the first white woman up there. <coughs> Excuse me. In 2019, Dave and I followed their footsteps backwards. We cheated. We started at the top. We started at Summerhaven and went downhill to Oracle. It was a really, really long, hot day. And we decided at that point that the lemons are way tougher than we are. Tragically, most of their route, which you can see here dotted and, and the, with the dotted red line, burned in 2020's Bighorn Fire. They then went to El Paso and the Chiricahuas. It was too hot really to botanize, so they came back that fall. On this trip, they also spent three weeks in Rucker Canyon, 11 days of which they were hiding from the Apaches in a tunnel with a crazed and sociopathic miner who set up an entire line of dynamite with the intention, as he said, to blow the Indians to smithereens. But you'll have to read that story in the book. During this trip, right near what is now Fort, Fort Bowie National Monument, Sarah discovered a new genus. Asa Gray described it and named it Plumera in honor of her maiden name. It's a yellow composite, sometimes called Apache Pass rubberweed, or less elegantly, sneezeweed. 
having, as you all know, having an entire genus name for you was a really, really big deal. And Sarah was delighted. She described her reaction in a letter to her father and said, I was so delighted with the honor and such a fine plant, two feet high, that I danced around our big herbarium, overturned the chairs, embraced Lamonia and mother in the most enthusiastic way, and they joined me in the celebration. And here you can see the actual, the actual specimen in the Smithsonian. Sadly, I am thanks to genetic studies that showed that it's not a separate gene, it's after all, it's now Hymenoxus ambigens. The following year, they returned to Arizona, but this time to Fort Huachuca, where they spent several months. They had intended to only go for a few weeks, but they discovered that it was a botanic paradise. And here's um, Fort Huachuca in the 1880s. Most of, of Sarah's artwork that you'll be seeing is from this time and this place. They usually camped, um, but often near, the, near enough to the, the fort that they could be protected from the Apaches. And she wrote to her father, I wish you could see our rough outfit of two gray rubber blankets, old flannel vests and drawers, old boots and hats, a big lunch basket filled with corned beef, crackers, cheese, and three or four jars of nice currant jelly brought in by good, thoughtful friends. So now we can look at just a few of the Arizona plants that are named for her. And as, as you all know, there are many, many plants named lemoni, but it is, I think, worth remembering that in 1884, Asa Gray made it clear in one of his papers um, that, quote, whenever the name of lemon is cited for Arizonian plants, it in fact refers to the pair of most enthusiastic botanists. So here you can see Plummer's Cliff Fern, again named the species name in honor of her maiden name, first time collected in the Chiricahuas in 1881. And here's a morning glory. First one collected by her in 1882. And this is a stevia, the same group of plants that people use to sweeten their tea. Plummer's Candy Leaf still has that name. First collected in the Huachucas, 1882. And this one is um, a succulent uh, since it's in the family Euphorbia. Sadly, this one has also lost its nomenclature connection to Sarah. Um, it's no longer called Euphorbia plumeri, it's now Anisophyllum macropus. But Allium plumeri still has its connection to her. And here's, here's another one. Sometimes you have to kind of think about what you know about Sarah and JG. I think it's a pretty good bet that this one is named for Sarah since the species name was Amabilis. And um, unfortunately, it's now changed its name. And it's now Stevia viscida, which means sticky, and in my mind, isn't nearly as romantic. Here's a, a specimen that was actually collected by Sarah from the Huachucas. And Dave and I were able to see it while visiting the Nebraska State Museum. It's Eutropha mycorrhiza, a nettle spurge. And I can tell you that after reading 1,200 pages of her letters, that's definitely her handwriting on the, on the plant label. Um, it's also interesting to notice that on the label, it says J.G. Lemon and wife, which is usually how she was identified. That's very typical of the times, and I will spare you the feminist rant. Except that I will say that several authorities believe that it was actually Sarah who did much of the botanical work that was credited to JG because he was so devastated by his war wounds. Here's the Eutropha in real life in the Peloncillo Mountains. And here's her painting of it. Uh, it's signed on the bottom. It's a, one of the watercolors on paper and you can see some foxing, the brown spots that are, that are here. And the signature, which is hard for you to read probably in the slide, uh, says SAP for Sarah Allen Plummer Lemon, Fort Huachuca Canyon, Arizona, June, July, 1882. In May of 1884, they were on the train from California 
um, and happened to meet a man named John Willard Young, who also happened to be the son of Brigham Young, who built Fort Moroni. And he invited them to stay at his ranch. So they remained his guests much of the summer. And while there, this, Sarah did this painting of the whole leafed Indian paintbrush. And on the back, she wrote Kendricks Mountain, Northern Arizona, 1884. So they were one of the reasons that they were on the train is because they were on their way to New Orleans because Sarah was in charge of organizing the Pacific Slope section of what was then known as the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition, which is a really long way of saying the World's Fair. They spent six months there and they spent most of their spare time hanging out with Clara Barton and her field agent, Dr. Julian Hubble. And I am, they, the four of them became very good friends and uh, Clara and Julian ended up going to California and they all camped together years later. Here's another highlight in the lives of this supposedly frail couple. Astoundingly, they decided to become homesteaders. And thanks to the wonders of the internet, I was able to locate a map of their actual claim. So Dave and I traveled there in 2019 in what we're all calling the before times. And in a stroke of really amazing good luck and, and happy timing, which I refer to as serendipity, we were able to get permission to walk the land where which they had actually homesteaded. And that dead walnut that you see in the center of the picture is right next to the spring that Sarah mentions in one of her letters. The first day they arrived, they set up their usual canvas tent. And then the second day they were there, uh, they, went, they left to go to a nearby range to get some firewood and somebody set fire to the tent, burned everything they had. Sarah being frugal, I think I mentioned that, um, she used what survived of the paper to write, write a letter to Maddie and undaunted, they ordered wood from San Luis Obispo and by hand they built a 10 by 12 cabin. And you can see her sketch of it here. She wrote her family about the fire um, and fortunately her older brother who normally was very disapproving actually sent some money to help pay for the lumber. From then on, generally the lemons were out in the field during the growing season collecting plants. Then they would spend winters at their herbarium in Oakland trying to eke out a living by selling specimens and seeds to collectors. They also produced several books, all of which were illustrated by Sarah and they did frequent botany lectures. This, this slide always makes me feel much better about my office. Uh, in 1903, they managed to pack up everything and they moved to what would become their last home. And that you, here you can see the herbarium at Telegraph Avenue. And here's the, the house. And if you look carefully on the front porch, you can see that it says Lemon Herbarium. Astoundingly, the house is still there. Um, we went there last year. Uh, it could use a little love if anybody wants to, you know, invest in, in real estate and in Oakland. Sarah remained passionate about healthcare. She was also very active in the Red Cross, thanks to her friendship with Clara Barton. And she wrote the history of the Pacific Slope Red Cross. That's actually no small accomplishment. I have a copy of the book and it's 486 pages with many, many photos. I also discovered that she very quietly established the first training school for nurses on the West Coast. She never mentioned it in any of her letters, but I ran across a reference in a nursing magazine where she, as the founder of the school, was handing out diplomas to the graduates. She was a frequent speaker about the importance of forest conservation, and she also spoke often at women's suffrage events. If you were to ask a Californian, they would probably tell you that Sarah Lemon's most well-known accomplishment was in 1903 after a 10-year battle when the golden poppy was named California's state flower. Arizonans might argue whether or not that was really the, the most significant accomplishment. In June of 1905, the Lemons returned to Tucson, hunted up Emerson Stratton, and the following month, three of them retraced their steps on five boroughs in honor of JG and Sarah's 25th wedding anniversary. 
it's hard to read at the top of, of this slide, but she wrote, this is to Maddie, both well and happy on this, our silver wedding journey. We sleep in the open air beside a delicious mountain stream that sings our nightly lullaby. Sarah at that point was 70 and JG 74. So by now she had made hundreds of paintings and the question is, where are they? And I'm afraid I might have an answer to that question. As those of you who've read the book know, Sarah was the second female member of the until then all male California Academy of Sciences. She was then the first woman who was allowed to speak to the group. After breaking through that barrier, she was at the Academy Herbarium frequently. She was there labeling plant, plants, sorting specimens. And in their letters, both she and JG often referred to sending their specimens there, as well as many of her paintings and her illustrations. And at 5.12 a.m. April 18th, the San Francisco earthquake convulsed the entire Bay Area and more. And as if the earthquake wasn't bad enough, fire gutted many, many buildings, including the California Academy of Sciences. At least 100,000 specimens were lost at, in the fire, and I'm terribly afraid that her paintings were among them. I would so love to be proven wrong. Although she wrote to her family saying, we are safe, though tremendously shaken, both Shara, Sarah and John were shattered by the loss of so much of their work. JG's health, which as you know, was already fragile, continued to decline over the next year and he lost much of his vision. He died of pneumonia in November, 1908, two days before their 28th wedding anniversary. After JG was gone, Sarah never really recovered. And in fact, Maddie believed that Sarah's cognitive decline actually began with the trauma of the earthquake. The family finally reluctantly committed Sarah to Stockton State Hospital on April 22nd, 1916. Ironically, that's the day that would become Earth Day. And the diagnosis was dementia. It was, it was terribly, terribly sad. She became profane and this very distinguished, elegant, brilliant woman had to be prevented from leaving the house, as the family said, unclad. She died January 15th, 1923, 99 years ago. The two of them are buried together in Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland under a gravestone that reads Partners in Botany. I really wanted a picture of this for the, for the book, but because of COVID, I couldn't get back to Oakland to, to get it. So Sarah's great, great grandniece, Amy St. John took the photo for the book. She and I have become friends during this whole research process. And in fact, here we are. Um, and she's, she's wonderful. After corresponding for several years, we finally got to meet last summer and went out for dinner and had just a really lively, fun time. But what about Sarah's artistic legacy? Some of her drawings are in books. Uh, interestingly, this one, if you look very closely up here, um, it was copyrighted in Sarah's name. Of course, many of these are black and white because there just wasn't the technology to reproduce color in books. Narrow Leaf Pine from one of JG's books about the pines of the Pacific Slope, and there are others. But what about those two boxes of paintings? To me, it's absolutely tragic that these exquisite and incredibly fragile watercolors on paper are still, to this day, jumbled into these two boxes that are too small for them. And there aren't even any archival sheets in between them. Um, it turns out that there are 276 pieces of art here. Not all of them are finished paintings. Many of them are unsigned sketches. And of course, times being what they are, the archives just have no money to do anything with them. So back in 2017, to get photographs for the book that I hadn't yet written um, and did not yet have a contract for, I, I really, really wanted to see what was in those boxes. So I hired a local art conservator for a day. And this is Susan Filter, who did the conservation treatment for the diary of John Wilkes Booth. So 
I was pretty sure that she could be trusted with Sarah's work. Um, and we spent a, a long day she, Dave, and I, we spent hours photographing every one of the 276 pieces, front and back, because there's a wealth of information written on the back of many of them. So we talked a little bit earlier, I talked a little earlier about the foxing and that a lot of them have insect damage and they're too fragile to ever be exhibited. Here's an example. Um, so this one, what's interesting about this is often the insects really like the paper, but they don't like the pigment. And, but as you can see this, sometimes the damage goes way, way beyond foxing. Here's another one, and it's hard to see this in the slide, but at the top it says uh, pink California poppy. In the middle, it says yellow California poppy. And down here at the bottom, it says Mariposa Lily. And if you flip the, the artwork over very, very carefully on top of a piece of paper, there they are. There is the pink California poppy, there is the yellow one, and down in here is the Mariposa Lily. Um, what's really interesting about this particular painting is it's not even by Sarah. It's by her teacher, Adelia Gates, who is whose work is in the Smithsonian. That's another whole story, which is which is fascinating. But I'll just leave it that because of the research that I've done with Sarah Lemon, I, Sarah is now a finding aid at the Smithsonian for Adelia Gates's work, which is really really exciting. Here's another one which miraculously is uh, spared from any kind of fungus and insect damage, and it is signed at the bottom right, um, Tanner's Canyon. Uh, this one of the Columbine has a little bit of foxing. Um, and this one she did, I love thinking of her on July 4th, Independence Day, sitting in Fort Huachuca Canyon, drawing this from life. And one more, uh, the Indian or edible thistle. So at this point, now that the book is out, some people might say that I ought to be done with Sarah by now. And actually, all along, I've thought of my life with Sarah as a project, not just a book. And I, it now appears that Sarah and I are going to be joined for quite a while longer. In fact, my husband Dave says he feels as if he's married two women, both me and Sarah. So phase one would be the book. Phase two is preserving or saving Sarah's art. And then phase three is continuing to spread the word. And back in 2017, I asked Susan Filter about what would need to happen to, to try to save the artwork. And this is a bunch of sort of long and complicated stuff, but basically it's really what needs to happen is the work needs to be stabilized and rehoused. I had resolved that whatever proceeds there are from the book, um, I wanted those proceeds to go toward preserving the artwork. I'm very careful to not use the word restored because as you can see, many of these are way beyond restoration. My goal is simply to make sure that they don't deteriorate any further. I am, Susan Filter is now retired, but when I got back in touch with her and said the book is out and I would love to see what could happen with preserving the artwork, she said she would be delighted to come out of retirement to conserve Sarah's artwork. And her fee is $1,500 a day. So that's really the biggest chunk of, of the required cost. So I kind of thought that I was gonna to get to kick back a little, take a bit of a break before the residency, the library residency started on February 1st, especially as I had a book deadline on January 31st. Um, but anybody who knows me well can tell you that you know, that's just not something that happens in my life. Plus, in December, I gave one of these forgotten botanist talks to the Sabino Canyon Volunteer Naturalists, and many of you know of them, terrific organization. And I, as usual, mentioned how tragic I think it is that this exquisite artwork is all jumbled up in boxes. And I mentioned my goal of using whatever proceeds there are from the book toward the next step, paying the conservator and getting archival boxes and folders. 
So doing this for just 30 paintings for starters would, I figured, probably cost around $5,000 and said to them, if you have any suggestions about foundations or grants that I can apply for funds, please let me know. And the following week, they asked me to come back and give another talk specifically about what would be involved to preserve her art. And the next thing I knew, they agreed to give me $3,500 for preserving her artwork. I then told another person about that who immediately said, I love Sarah's artwork and I love what you're doing. May I give you $1,000 toward it? I very happily said, yes, that particular donor wants to remain anonymous. So with the money that I'm, I'm already getting from these two donations, plus the, the honoraria for the talks, we now have $5,000 toward the preservation of Sarah's work. So that should cover the cost to stabilize and rehouse at least 30 of Sarah's paintings. I've now been in touch with the archivist and jumped through all the necessary hoops um, to get permission to actually do the work there on their premises. And they're really excited, uh, especially as they don't have to pay for anything. Susan Filter, as I said, had retired, but she's very happy to come out of retirement to do the work. And let's see, so this is a screenshot of the viewing folders. These are archival um, quality, and it means that each piece of artwork would have its own folder and could be looked at by, by researchers or archivists or whoever then we don't know yet at this point exactly how many of the folders will fit into the boxes, but the boxes will be plenty roomy enough so that they, the art won't be scrunched in and the corners won't be breaking, broken off. Here's just a, a preliminary estimate. Uh, again, the art conservator's time is the, is the, big, the big expense. The project workflow, um, I've already got permission um, and the work is now scheduled. Uh, it's all set, but it was a little tricky getting everybody's schedules between not being there when, when classes were happening, when the archivists weren't on vacation, when Dave and I could get there, when Susan Filter was available, but we are all set for late August. So the next thing to do is to simply purchase the materials. So it's that's to me is just tremendously exciting. Phase three uh, would be just simply continuing spreading the word. Um, it turns out that the second printing of the Forgotten Botanist is, is going to have to happen a lot sooner than I'd expected. Um, that involves another $2,000 subvention. And a subvention is a, a elaborate word for when in academic presses, if you're gonna do color reproduction, color photographs, academic presses ask authors to help support that. Some, the one publisher I talked to uh, wanted to charge between 15 and $20,000 for the photographs, the color work that's in the Forgotten Botanist. So I feel as if $2,000 for University of Nebraska Press is a really good deal. I would want to continue the promotional activities. There's botanical illustration groups who are very much on board with this project. And there's also quite a few people who are interested in developing curricular materials that would help teach kids about botany, about Sarah, about botanical illustration, about identifying plants by drawing them. And then I am, I, Ultimately, I would love to see something called a catalog raisonné, which is an elaborate phrase, meaning a very, very high resolution art catalog. And if you do them in print, they're hideously expensive. But my idea would be to do it online, have high quality digital scans and a digital catalog that anybody anywhere in the world would be able to see Sarah Lemon's work at no cost. Any ideas that, that you all have um, are more than welcome. Just email me, I'm happy to hear any ideas. So that's where the Sarah Lemon Project is for now. Uh, it's come a long way since the last time we all met. Uh, and I hope you all agree with me that Sarah, I really think is another hidden figure of both science and art. 
she so deserves a mountain in her name and a book and that her work really deserves to be preserved. The book is available wherever you buy books. Um, and if you look in the chat, you can see where they're available locally. I've been encouraging people to support their local independent bookstores wherever they are. Um, yes, I do buy things from Amazon, but try to support our local bookstores. Um, mostly books, Antigone and Western National Parks have it in stock. Um, and for those people who are watching remotely, which of course is everybody, um, I do have book plates. You can see one there on the right. And if you'll send me your snail mail address, I'm happy to send you an inscribed autographed book plate that you can then put in your book. So that's it. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, do email me if you'd like to sign up for the newsletter. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions and I'm going to figure out how to stop sharing. Let's see, how about stop share button? I think that worked. Did that work? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, you're back. Now I'm trying to. Well, thank you so much, Wynn. That was just a wonderful presentation and it's really exciting, I think, to see some of the behind the scenes things um, that didn't make it into the book. That picture of the two of them in front of that huge tree um, was just really interesting. <laughs> um, and let's see in the chat, um, I think we have a, quite a few thank yous and also thank yous in the chat to um, our ANPS officers. Um, and do we have, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, or we can also try, let's see if I do a gallery view if you want to um, hold up your hands and ask a question that way, we can also do that. And I'm hoping that other people are hearing us. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. I have, okay. I have a question if I could jump in. Um, yeah, I think let's just do that. So I was really intrigued that they had their own herbarium in Oakland in their own home. And did the specimens that they collected eventually then get moved to uh, um, an institutional herbarium? How did, how did that work? That's a really sad thing because they did have the herbarium in their home. And as, as I think that because of the earthquake, they really didn't maintain things. The roof started leaking. And um, after they were both dead, uh, Jepson himself went to the house to try to rescue whatever he could, and many, many of the specimens were just ruined. They just hadn't been taken good care of, and a lot of, you know, a lot of their books and papers had just just turned into piles of of insect damage, uh, rodents, and who knows what was lost. That's really sad. It um, is. Yeah. Did they make duplicates when they were collecting and put them in other herbariums? Uh, herbarium? Yeah, I think that's why it, they have some of their their specimens are in, at Kew. Some of them are um, in Nebraska. They sent things all over the country, fortunately, because otherwise they're they're you know we wouldn't have any records at all. Um, but you know, it, and it's hard to know. There's a there's another really good book. It's it's by Brad and Kelly Agnew, and its focus is on John Lemon rather than Sarah Lemon. But if you read the two books together, I think they really they really complement each other. And um, because they were more interested in in John as a botanist and a Civil War uh, survivor they have more emphasis on things that that I didn't include. And because I was focusing on Sarah, I was focusing on different things, but they they did a terrific job. They they self published it, published it independently on Kindle. And it's I think it's 800 pages, 600 pages. It's huge. 
and deeply, deeply researched. Um, and he talks more about um, the, the loss of the material and, and quotes Jepson about, about just what a shame it was to lose all those. And um, there is a question asking when, if, if you have any idea how many hours you spent transcribing Sarah's letters, you know, I don't know I, how you were even able to read those letters. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I do track um, all of my time for when I'm working with clients. Um, and just for grins over the seven years, I just kept running this little app whenever I was working on the Sarah project. <laughs> and um, I'm afraid to pull it up because if I do, I'm afraid I'll lose the Zoom window. But it ended up being about 10,000 hours. On the on the whole project, right? On the whole project. Mm -hmm. Wow. There's um, I'm going to add it to um, to my website, but there's a, there's a new tab on my website called resources that I added because of the library residency. And there's um, there's a, there'll be a new um, video on there that talks about some of the tools that I use to track. Uh, the letters, because I had what, what I call the project brain is just basically a word table, but it's 42 pages in nine point type. Um, and it's a timeline is how I tracked every one of those 1200 pages of letters. And then I use tap base as a, or tap form as a database for the artwork. And so that, that particular presentation, which will be up on my website in a few days, um, has some of that information if anybody's interested. That's just overwhelming. Well, one thing that I think of about the the loss of all the material, which that is, or their material, which is tragic, but yet they got such enjoyment out of collecting it. You know, to th and in her when she's talking about it, I mean, all of this camping, you know, and never talking about like, I mean, it, they must have gotten rained on a lot. They must have gotten blown. They, you know, just the the rough life just didn't seem to make any difference to them. In, in her just, letters, she oh. never complained about. Um, she she would complain about how tired they were when they got back to Oakland or yeah. they were sick because it was a really, really rough collecting trip. But I think that for both of them, particularly the time they spent in Arizona was really a highlight for them of, of their lives. That's really something. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing other questions here. Like I said, if anyone would like to just um, ask anything, you're certainly welcome to. I guess I had one last question. I had to put the cat in the kitchen. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the the route that you took when you hiked down from Mount Lemon, did you use the road that's the exact no, we, road. Yeah, that's the we did not do the control road. Interestingly, um, we just did the control road last Friday. Um, and um, and but when we walked it, we used the Oracle Ridge Trail. Okay. okay. Which I you know, there's no way to know exactly which way they went, but because of the topography, it seems logical as if that, you know, would be the easiest way to, to take pan, pack animals up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And did you drive or walk the control road last week? We drove it. Yeah. <laughs> we learned our lesson. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so did you make that hike in one day? We did. Yeah, it's 13 miles. And, you know, we kept saying it's downhill. How hard can it be? Well, as, <laughs> as, as many of you know, with aging knees, downhill sometimes is way harder than uphill. Yeah, they both, yeah. 
it was actually how Dave and I um, have only been married four years. And so that was our first wedding anniversary. We thought that would be a nice way to, to celebrate our wedding anniversary. <laughs> um, so the, for our fourth wedding anniversary, we drove up the control road instead of walking down. <laughs> There is a question in the chat from Grace about, um, I think she's referring to the time they spent on the south side of the mountains and their many attempts to get to the top. She said, with the paths that dead ended, do you think that they were animal trails they were following? I think that's a, a, there's a good chance that that's exactly what they were following. And driving up there last week, um, I was trying to figure out how far would two not particularly sturdy people get on foot while collecting plants. And I'm wondering if it was right around the Thimble Vista, Thimble Peak Vista, where for the first time they could see that what they saw from the desert floor was not the top of the mountains, because at that point you can see some pinnacles they aren't actually at the very top of Mount Lemmon, but I'm wondering if that's the guardian pinnacles that, that he's referring to. And if you if you drive Catalina Highway, Thimble Peak is not very far up there. They had a long, long way to go. Yes, it's very, very impressive, the effort and the energy that must have gone into that given their ill health. It's it's really hard to conceptualize. See, somebody has a question about the camping picture. Was she wearing, let's see, let me pull that up. A Which skirt, part? yes. Um, she did wear, and I think that because she was having her picture taken and she was at the fort, I think she was wearing a skirt. But she does talk about um, wearing sort of Turkish trousers um, <laughs> in the field. And that came from somebody who was in Arizona earlier. Um, but the, you know, the material was thick, heavy. But she talks about broadcloth. And you know, this wasn't this wasn't Gore-Tex or or anything, you know, <laughs> light, the, the light things that trail runners use these days to shed heat. Um, they just must have been melting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, th I think probably um, we don't see any more questions. Are there any more? Here's something else in the chat. Oh, uh, oh let's see. Yeah, no, no, no more questions. So this has been. I really appreciate the invitation. I always, I always love talking to. The native plants people. I've talked to the Cochise chapter and the Flagstaff chapter, and you know, you guys are just one of my absolute favorite audiences. It's nice to talk to plant people. Well, we are super appreciative. Susie, do you have some comments here, or Jack? Thank you, Wynn. We really appreciate it, and thank you so much for for shining a light on this just incredible topic. The book is an absolute blast to read. So. Uh, your efforts are greatly appreciated. Thanks for all you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I love hearing that. Thanks so much. And I'm so glad people are enjoying the book. So you guys probably have other, other 